Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad that we're free today, church? I said, aren't you glad that we're free today? We have a lot to celebrate God for this morning. I'm going to tell you what, we've uh, had a chance to play a few games, to have a little bit of fun this morning, but I'm going to tell you what, the greatest thing that we can ever do is to praise and worship our God. And because of our God today, we have true freedom. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, is true freedom. Now, I want you to stop and think for just a moment. Have you ever heard people say, or have you really thought about the meaning when people say that we are from the land of the free and the home of the brave? We hear that said a lot, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I want to tell you something this morning. Freedom always comes with a cost. As a matter of fact, the reason that we're free to worship here this morning is because men and women who have put their life on the line, men and women who have served, gone above and beyond, that we may have the freedoms to worship the way that we do today. Now, I recognize, amen, let's give them a big hand. I recognize this is July the 4th. But this morning, if there's any men and women who have served in the military, would you please stand this morning? Anybody who's served in the military, amen. Stand up for just a moment. I want you to look around. Amen. Thank you, guys. I want to say thank you to you men and women who have served this country. Because if it wasn't for those men and women, we wouldn't have the freedoms that we have today to come in here to worship freely the way that we do. You see, when we sit and we think about freedom this morning, I want to read you a passage of Scripture. And it comes out of John chapter 8 and verse 36 says this. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Today I want to talk a little bit about our religious freedoms that we have that comes through Jesus Christ. But before we get there, I think so many times we come to July 4th and everybody gets excited about July 4th because everybody likes to cook on the grill hot dogs and hamburgers and barbecue. And I know you guys are getting hungry and there's barbecue on the grill and there's fried chicken coming in. There's no church service ever good without fried chicken. We understand how Nazarenes are. And I, and I know everybody loves all the great food, but I want to tell you something about really how our country really started. I want to read you some this morning, uh, a few things this morning I want to read to you about the way that this great country really became the country that we are today. It says that John Jay was the very first chief justice and often called the father of our Supreme Court. And this is what he says. He was one of the writers of our Constitution. He wrote this. It is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians as their rulers. Think about that for a moment. One of the gentlemen, the authors of our Constitution, said it is our duty as a country to select and prefer Christians. Could you imagine if this thought was still going today, going a little bit further? It was the state of Delaware, along with most other states, states required office holders to take an oath affirming their Christian faith before they could take office. And they had a very logical reason for that requirement. Not only did Congress in 1782 approve the use of the Bibles in their schools, they actually paid for the Bibles with tax dollars. In 1844, when somebody sued for the removal of the Bibles from the school, this is what the Supreme Court said in 1844. We should, why should not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as divine revelation in the school. Where, the, where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly as from the New Testament? This was our government several years ago. And it goes on even further. Think about this. If these people today who are so instrumental in establishing our nation... We're here to do all these things today. Our country will probably consider them as right-wing radicals 
and a threat to our nation. And I really don't think that's an exaggeration today, but I'm going to tell you what, our country was founded on biblical principles this morning. The freedoms that we have come because our founding fathers understood how important Scripture was. Listen to this. There is so much about our early history that most Americans don't even know. Our school systems, our colleges and universities have been become so secularized and so distant from religion that huge chunks of information from our spiritual roots have been neglected. Many Christians never ever hear about the true foundation of the United States unless it comes from a church because they never hear it in public schools anymore. As a matter of fact, our, our country has been so, become so secularized, all these things have been taken out. This morning, I want you to understand, number one, a desire for religious freedom is actually what started America. A desire for religious freedom is what actually started America. The earliest settlers who came here primarily looking for religious freedom from other nations, for the most part, the United States came into existence not because of conquest, for selfish ambitions and motives. It was primarily in the atmosphere of God, not gold, not glory, that America was born. Those who sailed in the Mayflower in 1620 fled from tyranny and oppression. In the Mayflower Compact, which was signed beneath the swinging lantern in the cabin of their ship, they proclaimed that they had come to the new world for the glory of God, listen to this, and the advancement of the Christian faith. You see, long before the United States began as the country that we know it, on the, in the Mayflower Compact, they clearly stated that the whole purpose of coming to this new land was for the advancement of the Christian faith. Now, you stop and think about that today. We live in a world that talks about religious tolerance, and we've got to tolerate this and that religion. I want you to understand the United States was founded as a Christian nation. And it's important that we get back to the roots where we came from. In the early colonies, the very first building that was erected in every colony was a church. Every colony that would come in, they would begin to build buildings. They would put up a church. The very first public worship exercise was to come into the church and praise God Almighty. When sorrows came, people came to the church to worship God. As a matter of fact, when they had bountiful harvest and they filled their barns. They would come to the churches together to give God praise. They understood what it meant to praise and worship God. Listen to this. In 1643, as more and more people arrived to the shores, they joined together the New England Confederation. They wrote a constitution, the first constitution written in the New World, which is America that we are in today, and it began with these words. Whereas we all come into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel and the pursuit of purity and peace. They understood we came here to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you look at our society and world now, everybody wants to take the name of Jesus out of everything. But our founding fathers, they came here and they understood that, you know, if we want to be blessed, if we want to be under the hand of God, we must worship God and we must, we must place our faith in Christ and Christ alone. Are you with me this morning, church? I know it's July 4th and you guys are hungry, ready for that hot dog, but I'm going to tell you what, God came and he sent Jesus that he may die on that old rugged cross that we may have true freedom. And when this country was born, and when this country came together, it was come together under the understanding that we must worship Jesus Christ. What brings us to number two, a desire to follow God and His will set the course to freedom. As the American founders came to found our nation, they had a strong desire to please God and to do His will. But before I want to go any further this morning, I want you to understand something. About 150 years passed from the earliest settlers to the beginning of our nation. And if you remember under that swinging lantern, they came there to promote God, and they understood that they came here to serve Jesus Christ. About 150 years had passed. And there are a lot of things that we're not so proud of. You see, as time passed, the original settlers died off. Their descendants were more concerned about increasing wealth and 
comfortable living more than they were about being faithful to God and His will. Does that sound like a lot like America today? You see, as time went on, as more and more immigrants arrived, they came for different reasons and for different motives than the early settlers. You see, whether out of concern for them or just to get rid of the undesirables, England began to promote emptying its prisons and making it possible for prisoners to come to the new world as indentured servants. At this time, the king of England granted vast tracts of land to his special friends. Slavery was introduced, as well as plantations. The spiritual atmosphere deteriorated. Churches were dying. The once country that sought religious freedom found themselves as being intolerant of others. And during this time, they went off in some strange spiritual directions. A lot of you remember around, 19, excuse me, around 1692, when a young slave girl who was bought by her master lived in Salem, Massachusetts, she began to tell all these wild stories to the young girls with vivid tales of powers of voodoo. And it wasn't long until fear filled the communities and the Salem witch trials began. As a result of all this, by the end of 1730, listen to this, this once group who came to America searching for religious freedom, wanting to promote and to enhance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Families that walked away from God. At one time, about 10% of the people in the colonies actually attended churches. What once had begun for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith had almost disappeared from the land. When I stop and I think about that, I wonder how much that resembles our country right now. That so many people have decided to Walk away from the gospel. Instead of church being the place they come to worship and praise God, instead of church being the place they come in their time of need, instead of church coming to the place when God has blessed them and, and have given them great and they came to praise Him, they say, you know, we're going to do it our way. And at this point in history, 10% of the people were coming to church. When I read those numbers, it's staggering and it's very sad. But you know what? I, I love what happened in the next part of our country's history when revival begins. As a matter of fact, something begin, amazing began to happen because in around 1734, about four years after this 10% of the people coming to church, something started to happen. There's pastors like Jonathan Edwards, George White Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, and a man by the name of John Wesley. And they began to preach in churches and in the streets and in the fields. Then this soon then turned to crusades and revivals throughout the 13 colonies. So many people came to Christ that the era became known as the Great Awakening. Ten thousands of people dedicated their lives to Jesus Christ and were baptized. So many people came to hear Whitfield as he traveled the colonies that they had to hold open air meetings because there wasn't enough room in the churches. You see what began to happen? Revival began to happen. People started to seek the face of God. These evangelists and these preachers were going around and they were telling people about God. And all of a sudden, these, these colonies that were once were dead, where they began to be alive in Jesus Christ, people began to hit their knees. They laid on their faces and they prayed for God. They began to seek the God they once served. I don't know about you, but I get excited about that. This country that we live in right now can come back to Jesus Christ. You know, and it takes each and every one of us getting on our knees. I want you to understand something about revival. Revival can happen at any time. You know why? Because revival begins in us. You see, revival begins with me. Revival begins with you. Revival begins with you when you say, Jesus, I want you to have my entire life. Lord, I want to live my life sold out for you. And all of a sudden, that spark becomes a wildfire. And that fire begins to grow. And this is what happened here. Listen to this. This is what Benjamin Franklin wrote. He goes, It was so wonderful to see the change. It was so wonderful to see the change soon made in the manner of the inhabitants. For being thoughtless and indifferent about religion, it seemed as if the whole world were growing religious. So that one could not walk through the town or even without hearing psalms sung and different by different families on every street. This is what happened. In fact, Franklin was so impressed with Whitfield 
in his preaching that he helped build an auditorium to accommodate up to 30,000 people so that they could come hear him preach. Now, this is where they built this center at. 30,000 people, they built an auditorium they could hear Whitfield preach in Philadelphia. Now, check this out. During that time, you know how many people lived in Philadelphia? 25,000 people. You see, he had such a vision. He said, I recognize that people are coming from all over to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. With his own money, Benjamin Franklin went to help build this place so people can hear the gospel. And you ask, well, Pastor Shannon, why are you telling me this? Because the Great Awakening was a precursor to the American Revolution. Our founding fathers, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, those who wrote the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, those who put their lives on a line, who fought and who died that we may be free. All these men grew up under the leadership of the Great Awakening that engulfed, the, 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 that engulfed America. The generation experienced the Great Awakening and they became the leaders of the American Revolution. Listen to this prayer right here that was written in George Washington's journal in his own handwriting. He says, Let my heart, gracious God, be as so affected with your glory and majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties which thou requirest of me. Again, I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for me. Thou givest a son to die for me, and has given me assurance of my salvation. The first president of the United States understood what it meant to have Jesus Christ to wash away his sin. I want you to understand something. When the American Revolution came about, these men and women had laid it all on the line for God. Over a 10-year, listen to this, over a 10-year period, political science professors from the University of Houston collected and cataloged 15,000 writings by our founding fathers. Their goal was to determine the primary source of ideas behind the Constitution. Listen to this very closely. By identifying the sources quoted most often by them, guess what that primary source was? It was the Bible. 94% of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights is quoted throughout Scripture, the primary source of writing. To sum all this up this morning, I want you to understand something. The United States was founded upon godly principles through the Scripture. You see, we come here this morning, we have the right to worship. You know why? Because these men and women, they understood something. They understood to follow Jesus Christ, to be sold out to Him, is where true freedom comes from. You see, this morning, I want you to understand something. When we look at the Declaration of Independence... It says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They are empowered by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, government, governments are instituted among men, devouring that their powers be constant. Uh, be, Powers from the consent of the governed. Basically, that you know what? Our rights come from the people for, the li for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which come from our scripture. God came that Jesus Christ may die on the cross that we may have life. Our life comes from God alone. Liberty, that we're free from sin. Pursuit of happiness, that, that we may pursue the life that we want to pursue that I have the ability to pursue the life that God has for me. I'm no longer in bondage to sin, but I have been set free. Listen to what Romans, excuse me, Romans 8, 1 through 4 says. Therefore, there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ, because through Christ, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son 
in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled and met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. In John 8, 34-36, I want to read this. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son has set you free, you are free indeed. You see, Jesus Christ out on that cross, not that we may be free to do whatever we want to do. Jesus died on the cross that we may be free to serve him. That we're no longer under the bondage of sin. You see, our founding fathers, when they went to fight, that we may have a free country, they understood something. We want to be able to live in freedom from religious persecution that we may serve God freely. The one true God. Not the false gods, not every other God, but they understood something, that Jesus Christ had died on that cross for them. You see, this morning, I want to tell you something, church. True freedom is found in Christ and Christ alone. You can do all you want to in life trying to pursue happiness and never, ever be happy. You see, because if we try to make ourselves happy and we try to do all these things in life, guess what? We always end up falling flat on our face. But when we begin to serve God, and we say, God, I want you to take my life and have my life first and foremost. Then all of a sudden we find true peace with God. We find freedom to be able to serve God. We find joy in realizing that my joy is in Jesus Christ and who I am. Happiness comes from the world, but joy comes in serving Jesus. That's when we have peace. That's when we find comfort in our time of needs. You see, this morning, I believe there's a lot of people that are sitting here this morning that we've tried to find independence and we've tried to find freedom from God and the things of this world. And it seems like we always keep coming up empty. And guess what? That's always going to continue to happen until we turn our lives over to Jesus Christ and say, God, I choose to serve you. God, I want you to have my life first and foremost. You see, this morning, you may be sitting in here this morning and saying, you know what, Pastor? It seems like my life just stays in shambles. It seems like I'm always stressed. It seems like I'm always worried. It seems like I'm always exhausted. I'm tired of being exhausted, Pastor. I want something more in life. I want to tell you what. The only way that we're going to find that is when we turn our lives over to Jesus Christ. Then we've become free from the bondage of sin. Because, see, what sin does is it creeps into our lives. And it costs us too much. As a matter of fact, we get under the bondage of sin. And we have no freedom at all. You see, because what sin does, it begins to dictate our lives. We become addicted. We carry shame. We carry guilt. And we keep adding all these things onto ourselves. Sometimes it's bitterness. Sometimes it's anger. You see, we don't receive true freedom from forgiveness and saying, God... I can't carry this anymore. God, I want true liberation. God, I want liberty. God, I want to be free. God, I can't do this anymore. And see, what happens is when we come to that altar of prayer, we come to that, that place in our hearts and we say, God, I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. God, I want to release it to you. God, I want to have freedom from bondage. God, I want to have freedom from sin, God, that I may live for you. I'm going to tell you what, there's nothing like living for Jesus Christ. When you truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you find the greatest freedom you'll ever have in life. So many people have tried to find freedom in so many other things, and they keep coming up empty. But all of a sudden, when you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's the greatest freedom that you'll ever have. I no longer have the weight of the world set on my shoulders. I don't have to do it alone. God, when I get to those places in life, God, and I can't walk any further, God said, that's okay. That's when I carry you. And all of a sudden, we then begin to realize something. You know what? I'm not walking through life alone. 
because I am part of a family. And we begin to realize that, you know what? This is my family sitting all around me. I've got brothers praying for me. I've got sisters praying for me. I've got a church that's praying for me. And all of a sudden, I realize that I'm something and part of something much greater than myself. I'm part of the family of God. And I don't know about you, but that's exciting. When I realize I don't have to do this alone, I don't have to do this on my own. I've got people who are encouraging me. I've got people who are walking beside me. I've got people going to tell me the truth even when I don't want to hear it. Now, that's a little scary, isn't it? But that's what true love is. When somebody will come alongside you, they'll link arms with you and say, you know what, we're going to do life together. You see, church, that's when you begin to get to a place where you find true freedom. Our founding fathers who wrote our Constitution, who wrote our Bill of Rights, who founded America, were men and women who believed in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I hear so much. This is a totally sad note. I hear so much about politics in the past year, and I'm sure all of you guys are tired of hearing about it. Stop asking the question, who should be the president, and start getting on your knees for a spiritual revival to happen. Because I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It matters who shows up in this house. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life, you've got trouble. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. No great politician is going to fix our country. There's no person with enough money. There's nobody smart enough. Until our country has a spiritual revival, we're not going to see real change. But I'm going to tell you what, if, if there comes a person in office who will hit their knees as they did when they were writing the Constitution, and they begin to pray. There was one of the framers of our Constitution who wrote his wife and said, you know what? He said, even the old stern Quakers have tears running down their face as they're sitting. Here's a picture of it, actually. He said, even the old stern Quakers have tears running down their face as they're seeking the face of God and how we're to write our Constitution. Could you imagine if our Congress and Senate was to hit their knees and begin to pray to the one true God and say we could care less about political correctness and the only thing that we care about is the truth of the Word of God? There are absolute truths in this world and they come from the Word of God and God alone. And I'm going to tell you what my prayer is, that as we celebrate this Independence Day, that we will begin to pray for our country. And the way that we begin to pray for our country is we begin to pray for ourselves and say, God, would you begin revival in me? Because guess what? If revival begins in you, it's going to go where you work at. It's going to go where you go to eat at. Revival is going to go to the grocery store when you go to the grocery store. And what happens is, it's just like Benjamin Franklin said, I couldn't go down a street where I heard people praising God or singing hymns. What happens is when Jesus Christ gets in your, comes into your life and, and, and you're filled with the Spirit, you get the, I can't help it. I can't help but tell people about Jesus. I can't help but sing praises to His name. I can't help but pray for others. I can't help but love other people. And all of a sudden, if we could get a, get a hold of that just a little bit, could you imagine that if everybody in this church gets, falls, fell so deeply in love with God that everywhere they went, they were telling somebody about Jesus? Could you imagine how different the world would be? Think about how many people you know that are hurting and they're searching for something more in life. And we have the greatest answer in the world. Could you imagine next week if four or five of your friends and their family showed up to church? You know what the greatest problem we would have is space. And that's a great problem to have. We have the answer to a lost, a hurting and dying world. And it's our responsibility to share Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity that we have to share Jesus Christ. God could have chosen anything else in the world, but he chose you.